We're going to move on to the next major uh, topic, and that is planning and research in church planting. Now, before we get into the details of what is involved with this, uh, just a couple of biblical reminders here. First of all, James 4, 13 to 15. Now listen you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why? Do you not even know what will happen tomorrow? What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. This means that whatever plans we may make, it's not necessarily wrong to make them, but we hold all our plans with an open hand. We cannot become too rigid with our plans. And I find it fascinating that in that sense, the Apostle Paul had his own experience, and this may be a small comfort to some of us who like to plan. In Acts chapter 16, where Paul is setting out on his uh, second major missionary trip, uh, we're told about how he had a few plans that didn't actually work out. It says that after Paul had uh, taken Timothy as a co-worker, in verse 4, they traveled from town to town, delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. And the churches were strengthened in faith and grew daily in numbers. Again, we see this growth. But then at verse 6, we read that Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. Paul apparently attempted to go to the province of Asia. That would be today um, Western Turkey. And the Holy Spirit prevented them. So apparently Paul made an attempt at what he thought would be a good idea, and the Holy Spirit, we don't know exactly how, said no. Verse 7, when they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. Here again, now first they try to go west, now they try to go north, and it says the Spirit would not let them. And so for a second time, Paul apparently thought, well, this looks like a good direction to go, and the Holy Spirit said no. So however detailed his plan may have been, at least two times he attempted to go in a direction where God had to redirect him. Well, it's at that point that he receives the so-called Macedonian vision uh, of someone in a dream saying, come over and help us. So he goes to Macedonia, and we know what happens next. Uh, they go to Philippi and Thessalonica, and these cities where churches were planted. So even from the Apostle Paul, we learn that whatever our plan may be, we have to be open to the redirection of the Holy Spirit. And of course, we know what happened in Asia. At that point in time, the Holy Spirit said no. But later, Paul travels all the way around, and on that same trip on the way back, that's when they go to Ephesus, which is in this province. And remember what we said, God had opened up a great door of opportunity in Ephesus. And that whole region ended up being reached. But now, in Acts 16, that was not God's timing. And so, yes, we want to be wise, we want to plan, but let's remember, God can always redirect those plans. Here's the other thing to remember. Proverbs 16, 9. In his heart, a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. The same thing. We may have the greatest plans, uh, but God may determine our actual steps. But there's also another side to this. And I like this one, Proverbs 16, 3. Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and your plans will succeed. In other words, we make our plans, we hold them flexibly, but we lift them up to the Lord and say, Lord, this is the plan that I think is the wise thing to do. And now I have to ask you to lead from there on out. So we commit those plans to the Lord. Proverbs 15, 22. Plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. 
In other words, when we make our plans, we want to gain wise counsel. We want to talk to other people, specifically when it comes to church planting. We may want to bring in and talk with other people who have planted churches, perhaps others who have worked in the region where we expect to plant that church, who can give us advice. We can learn from their experience. And so wise counsel is important to being effective. One of the things we've discovered that's a real key to effectiveness in church planting, we spoke about assessing church planters, making sure that people who are really gifted in, for church planting are the ones doing it, but also coaching church planters. In other words, having someone with ministry experience, preferably church planting experience, coming alongside of that person who's planting the church, uh, giving them wise counsel, uh, helping to solve problems, perhaps warning where there may be difficulties, helping that person think through issues. And so wise counsel is going to be important in the way we make our plans. So sometimes I've run into this. Uh, I remember teaching in Eastern Europe at a seminary very shortly after the fall of the Iron Curtain and new freedoms were opening up. And uh, I was teaching, actually, it was one of the first times I ever taught a course on church planting. And I came to this section on planning. And that was the first time in this course where I got a little bit of pushback where, where people were saying, what's all this business about planning? I mean, how could you really plan anything? Don't we just sort of need to follow the Holy Spirit? And, and um, I think that they'd probably had uh, enough experience with five-year plans, economic plans, government plans that never panned out in five years. And they sort of thought, well, planning really doesn't pay off very much. And uh, I can understand that. And as we've said, we always need to keep our plans open to change. But we also want to be wise. And we don't want our zeal to push us forward into doing things that end up being foolish. So we want to base our planning on good information. And we want to bathe our planning in earnest prayer. In other words, good planning is not just a matter of getting information and of being logical and trying to figure out the most efficient and ways to do things, but it's also a matter of prayer. And so God gives us the insight we need, and God even directs our thoughts in that planning process. So one other thing about planning, keep your plan simple flexible, and participative. In other words, we can be frustrated if we make a plan. We say, well, in this church, in year one, we're going to do this, 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 this. And in year two, we're going to do this, this, this. We will become frustrated because we'll never be able to fulfill that plan in that much detail. So we want to keep our plans basic, simple, broad, but we know what direction we're going. And as we've said, they need to be flexible. And I've added this point, they need to be participative. Now, I know in some cultures there's different leadership styles, and it's expected of a leader to be the person who really leads out and can inspire others to follow, and a leader who spends too much time discussing and, and trying to vote on things and stuff, that leader may be perceived as being weak or somehow not knowing what they really want to do. Other cultures are just the opposite where we're going to discuss everything and we want to vote on everything and don't you dare try and tell us what uh, God wants for us. So you've got these different extremes and leadership styles. And I think that uh, any of these styles can, can be used by God. But to be participative doesn't mean that we discuss everything uh, over and over again and vote on everything necessarily, but it does mean that we need to enlist the feedback from others and give others that sense that this is what God wants and they're a part of it. And so sometimes that uh, will mean uh, spending a lot of time with people, finding out what their questions are, what their issues are. Even in cultures where leaders are strong and just lead out, they often spend a lot of time what we call drinking tea with people. <laughs> they spend time informally talking with others and where are they really at and what do they really think about this? And then I begin to get a sense where the people are at and after I've got that sense of consensus, then I can stand up and say, this is what I believe the Lord wants. And I have that sense that this is not just my individual opinion, but others are sensing that too. And so we, just sense, we sense the, the guidance of the Spirit also collectively 
um, in a participative sense. So there's different ways in which we can be participative in our leadership and in our planning. Now one of the third first things that we're going to be doing in planning and thinking about a church plan is the question of where and with what people. Where do we want to plant this church? And um, so the focus group is in one sense about geography. So we may be picking a certain uh, city, a community. We may be picking a, a village. It may also be a focus group in the sense of a particular ethnic group. We want to plant a church among immigrants that are living here. Uh, we spoke before about planting a church maybe among gypsies. So there may be subgroups, subcultures. Um, and so what is that people, what is that community, where we're going to plant the church? So that's going to be sort of the first question, and there are many factors that are going to come into that. What is the spiritual need of the community? Um, what is the openness of the people to receive the gospel? Are there other groups also working there? Um, or is this a totally new pioneer place? Do we have a sense of the Holy Spirit leading? Where we have that sense, this is where God wants us to go. Maybe we can't quite logically put our finger on it. We just have a strong sense, this is where God wants us to go. Maybe we're talking about diaspora, where sometimes God scatters Christians, and maybe there's already a group of Christians in that community that are just waiting to get involved to start a church. And so there's many different factors that might come together in discerning what part of a city or what location or what people group is the best place to plant that church. And that's really a matter also of both research and prayer. Some people will say, well, is it really legitimate to have a specific focus group? Um, would it be right to really focus on gypsies? Is it really right to just focus primarily on immigrants? This gets, again, back to that question we had earlier. Um, should a church be composed of people who are alike and have a lot in common? Um, or should a church seek to be as diverse as possible? And as we were saying before, sometimes there are just pockets of people subcultures or, or ethnic groups are just not being reached by anybody else. Or maybe they speak another language. They just don't understand the general language and you need to learn their language. And in those cases particularly, there needs to be an outreach to them, uh, to plant a church for them. So the factors I just mentioned, uh, the factors to determine the focus group can be a whole variety of of uh, spiritual, practical issues that come into that decision. While we continue being a benevolent project, your kind donations will continue to be vital in fulfilling the calling of TVS ministry. We do count on your gracious support and cooperation. For detailed information, please visit tvsseminary.com.